Good morning, EBF. This recording is for Sunday, September 20th, and this morning we're going to dig into Genesis chapter 14, and that is going to be our launching point as we continue to work through Genesis. And this morning we are going to learn about a guy named Melchizedek. Can you spell it? There's your Howard Scripps spelling bee word for the day, Melchizedek. And who was Melchizedek? What's so significant about Melchizedek? And how is Melchizedek connected to Jesus? And hopefully by the time you're done listening to this and reading these verses for yourself, you're going to have a better understanding of the significance of Melchizedek and a better understanding of the priestly system that was started in the Old Testament and fulfilled in the New Testament by Jesus Christ. So let's pray, and then we're going to dive into Genesis. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you speak to us through your word, and you have spoken to us through your Son. You have also revealed yourself to us through creation and we praise you for that and we pray now that you would open our eyes to see your word open our minds to understand your word open our hearts to receive your word and pray that we would be men and women boys and girls who apply this holy scriptures to our life and that this word of God would pierce us and would take resident in our hearts and flesh itself out every day as we live by faith and not by sight. And so we love you and we thank you that you speak to us. And we pray that you would speak to us this morning through your word and through your Holy Spirit. And we give ourselves to you now and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I would encourage you to open up to Genesis 14. And I'm not going to read verse by verse Genesis 14. I'm kind of going to recap the story that we find ourselves in. It's an interesting story about a king. His name was Kedor Le Laomer. Kedor Laomer. And I say that ten times fast, right? Kedor Laomer. Kedor Laomer, I don't think he was probably a good king, but he was basically ruling over other kingdoms. And there were another, a, a number of other kingdoms that every year would pay money to Kedor Laomer. And the text tells us in Genesis 14 that there was five kings, which included the kings of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah, who decided, we don't want to pay you your money. And so they didn't pay him his tribute this particular year. In the 12th year, or the 13th year, they didn't pay him his money. They paid for 12, and they said, enough is enough. We're not paying him his money. If he wants it, he can come get it. And essentially that's what happened. Kedor Larimer went to war and on the way to Sodom and Gomorrah and these other three kingdoms that were close to them, he attacked a number of other kings, the text tells us, and he defeated them. And then he gets to uh, close to where these other five kingdoms are from these five cities and they come out to meet him in war and it says as they're fleeing they're falling into tar pits, basically really bad quicksand that essentially when you fall into those, most of the time you're going to die. And so the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah flee, the people flee, and Kedar Laramar is victorious. He not only is victorious over the kings, but he, the text says he goes into Sodom and Gomorrah and he takes all of their goods wipes them out and he takes the people or some of the people anyways and it says he takes lot abram's nephew and all of lot's possessions now this is a fulfillment right here of genesis chapter 12 isn't it because in genesis chapter 12 the lord says to abram that he is going to bless abram he is going to make him into a great nation he also says he's going to bless those who bless Abram and curse those who curse Abram. And last chapter we saw Lot 
make a bad decision to move next to Sodom. And now Lot is suffering the consequences of being outside of the blessing that God spoke to Abram. And so Lot's captured and all of his possessions are taken. And then the next part of the story we read is, is somebody escaped from being captive um, or being, you know, taken uh, a captive. And they fled and they came and they told Abram what had happened. Abram now is spurred into action to go and try to save his nephew Lot. So the text says that he gathers together 318 of his trained men, which shows the wealth that he has, the number of servants and people in his family and clan and followers, essentially. And so he takes these men, along with other people in the land that he was in allies with, uh, lists the names of these guys, I think Mamre and Eshkol and Aner, and he was allied with them, and so they all go, and they pursue Keterlamer to try to find him and rescue Lot. And the text says that they were pretty good and successful in this endeavor. They pursued him, and they found him, and at night, you can see the strategy that Abram uses is pretty legit, because he divides his guys up, and at nighttime, in the dark, they launch a surprise attack, and they're successful, and they rout their enemy. They even follow them many miles to go and take them out, and they rescue Lot and his possessions, and it even says other people. And so they're moving back now into where the, uh, Abram's home was, and as they're coming through the valley, he's greeted by two different kings. The king of Sodom and the king of Salem, whose name was Melchizedek. Now it's interesting, you can contrast the two kings pretty easily here when you look at the very first words that the kings say. The first part of the text says that the king of Salem, King Melchizedek, he speaks a blessing onto Abram. He blesses him by saying in verse 19, blessed be Abram by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. So that's the blessing that he receives from Melchizedek. But notice the contrast of King Sodom, who we know is an evil, wicked king. He comes, and the first two words he says to Abram are, Give me. Give me. And, and he wants his loot. He wants the people. He wants the goods. Essentially, though, he says in verse 21, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. Now, I believe, in studying this passage, Abram recognizes, for one, the wickedness of Sodom. And he's already made an oath, he says in the next couple of verses, that he is never going to receive anything that the king of Sodom is going to offer to him. And so he gives back all of the loot that he had recaptured from Keterlaomer, the evil king. And, and really, the, the story of Genesis 14 ends right here. And, and you would read it and you think, okay, that was interesting. This Melchizedek guy, I guess he's a priest who believes in God. Because it said he was a priest and a king. Um, he believes in the God Most High. Just like Abram. So Abram wasn't the only one who worshipped God. But there's more than meets the eye to this story. And I think that's what's fascinating about God's word. Is we're just in the book of Genesis here. But Melchizedek is a very significant character throughout the Bible. And there's a number of reasons why. But we're going to get into that right here. Melchizedek, you see, he was a model or a pattern of the priest that was to come in the future. 
that would be the ultimate permanent priest that the Israelites would really be longing for and actually really needing to have salvation from their sins once and for all. And we're going to dive into this, but look at this uh, blessing that Melchizedek gave to Abram in verse 19. When he said, Blessed be Abram, God most high, creator of heaven and earth. You see, the Canaanites at this time, they were polytheistic. And many years after this, they were polytheistic, which meant they worshipped many gods. And the Canaanites, they discovered through archaeology, worshipped the god Baal. And Baal was the god of lightning or thunder, the god of rain. And it was very common, and probably the king of Sodom would, worshiped, uh, would have worshipped Baal at this time as well. But Melchizedek, he worshipped God Most High. And it's very important in verse 18, as he brings out bread and wine, which doesn't symbolize communion or have any connection with communion at this time. It's just a meal. But he brings out bread and wine. And the, and the text says he was priest of God Most High. And so we see this character Melchizedek. He was a priest. And he was a king. And this is really important because Melchizedek doesn't come up in the Bible again until Psalms. And when you understand the name Melchizedek, what it means, this is also very significant. You see the name Melech. The first part of his name, Melch Melech in Hebrew, means king of righteousness. And the second part, uh, Zedek, means, i got to look at my notes here, Zedek means, um, oh sorry, I got this mixed up, Melech means king, and Zedek means righteousness. So Melchizedek was the king of righteousness. And it's also significant that he was the king of Salem, and we know this to be not just Salem, but Jerusalem. It was short for Jerusalem. And Jerusalem, Salem, actually means shalom, peace. So here you have this priest and this king who is, who is a king of righteousness, who would have a kingdom of righteousness and a kingdom of peace. Now this is important because when we read Psalm 110, we're going to find out our next um, appearance of Melchizedek, and it's going to come from David. David is, we believe, speaking probably about his son, Solomon, but in the inspiration of Scripture by the Holy Spirit, we know that actually God is using David to speak a prophetic message about the coming of Messiah who would come in the order of Melchizedek, come as a priest and a king. You see, Melchizedek, he worshipped God. And he was a real man, we believe that. And he worshipped the Creator God, just like Abram. And so flip to Psalm 110. When you go to Psalm 110, we read, it's just seven verses here. The first uh, three verses declare... Uh, truth and pro prophetic word about a coming king and the second three verses there uh, or the last three verses are about an oath of a coming king so look at psalm 110 it says the lord says to my lord david writes sit at my right hand until i make your enemies a footstool for your feet the lord will extend your mighty scepter from zion you will rule in the midst of your enemies your troops will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy majesty. From the womb of the dawn you will receive the dew of your youth. The Lord, verse 4, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind that you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook beside the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. 
this passage has long been recognized by the church over the last 2,000 years of being the most prophetic passage about the coming Messiah in the book of Psalms. Primarily because of this connection of Psalm 110 all the way back connecting to Genesis chapter 14 that the coming Messiah is going to establish a priest who's going to come in the order of Melchizedek, a priest who is going to be eternal, a priest who is going to come bringing a kingdom of righteousness, and also a priest and king who's going to come bringing a kingdom of peace. And the beautiful thing is, you and I know the end of the story because we've read through to Revelation. And we know that a king does come and a priest does come, a great high priest, who is going to do something for the not only the Jewish people, but also the rest of the world, what we could never do for ourselves. And so as we, as we think about this, Psalm, the coming descendant David, we know that the prophecy speaks of this Messiah that would be superior to any other priest. We know the end of the story, don't we? And we're going to get to Hebrews, actually, because Melchizedek is mentioned ten times in the Bible. The first time is Genesis 14. The second time is Psalm 110. And then the next eight times Melchizedek appears in the scriptures are in the book of Hebrews. And the author of Hebrews, and we're going to flip to Hebrews right now. Let's flip to Hebrews. The author of Hebrews emphasizes the importance of Melchizedek and mentions Melchizedek eight different times. Because he is going to help us understand the significance of who this great high priest and this great king, Jesus, was and what he accomplished. And so for us to understand this, I think it's important for us to get a grasp again and kind of refresh our memory about the system in the Old Testament that God set up. Um, the Levitical system that God set up in the Old Testament so that men could have their sins atoned for. So if you think about the Old Testament, you think about the book of Exodus. Um, You think about the tabernacle. First of all, the tabernacle was this tent. And God wanted the Israelites to build a tabernacle and to take the tabernacle with them And to set it up wherever they would go. It would be covered with animal skins. It wasn't necessarily pretty in the Old Testament, but it did the trick. It did the job. And the tabernacle would have a courtyard where anybody could come around the courtyard. But once you got into the courtyard, you had to be a Jewish person. And once you came past the brazen altar, you had to be a Jewish person and a priest to enter into uh, a, a space that was closer to the, the holy of holies and the most holy place in the tabernacle. And so once the courtyard, that, that led up, once you passed the brazen of altar, that led up to the steps into the actual tabernacle or tent itself. And only the priests were allowed to go into the tabernacle, into the first room, which was the holy of holies. And so you would have this room that had a number of different items in that room. We're not going to get into all that. But then there was this curtain, very thick curtain. And this curtain, the priest could go into the first room, but no one could go past that curtain, which separated the Holy of Holies from the most holy place. And so in the most holy place, you had the Ark of the Covenant, You had the mercy seat, which was on the Ark of the Covenant. And only one day a year, you would have the high priest that would go in through the curtain to the Holy of Holies to make atonement for the sins of the people. And the priests were only people who were from the line 
of, of the tribe of Judah, or sorry, the, the tribe of Levi. And uh, so we know the first priest was Aaron in Exodus chapter 28. God established Aaron, who was from the tribe of Levi, to be the first priest to start this Levitical priesthood, who were men who would basically make sacrifices day after day after day with pure, spotless, unblemished animals. They would sacrifice them to make atonement for sins. And, you know, God never set this system up to be a permanent system. There was problems in this system. It had to be done over and over every day. And then once a year, the great high priest would have to go in to make atonement for the sins of the nation of Israel. And even the priests themselves, they were sinful in and of themselves, so they had to offer sacrifices for themselves in the first place. And on the Day of Atonement, the whole nation of Israel would stop what they were doing. And the, the great high priest would go, everything would be silent, he would go in, into the Holy of Holies, to make atonement for their sins. So this is important for us to understand again and be refreshed on, as we think about the significance of Melchizedek, and who he was as a priest and a king, and who this prophesied one was who would be coming in the order of Melchizedek and would be superior than Melchizedek in so many different ways. And so when you get to Hebrews, and you get to Hebrews chapter 4, we think now, and we come to the, the explanation about Jesus Christ being our great High priest, and what's so spectacular about Jesus being our great high priest? Because the, the only one who is worthy to come into the presence of God one time a year into the Holy of Holies was the great high priest for the Israelite people. And so when I think about, and as I've been studying this whole reality of the great high priest, what's so significant about Jesus being the great high priest for you and for me, the book of Hebrews just knocks it out of the park over and over and over, giving me reasons, giving us reasons to be thankful, to praise God that Jesus is the great high priest and the great king of this universe. And so I, I have a top 10 list, Sean Tenclay's top 10 list of why I am thankful that Jesus is the great high priest and king. And there's more. This is just my top 10. You can come up with your own top 10 as you dig into Hebrews 4 through 10. But we're going to go through my top 10 list of why I'm thankful that Jesus came in the order of Melchizedek and was much superior to Melchizedek himself. And so, number one, if, if uh, you look at Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, the first reason I am thankful Jesus is my great high priest is from Hebrews 4:14. 4, he has gone through the heavens. Jesus has gone through the heavens. Hebrews 4:14. 4, says, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith that we possess. So just as in the Old Testament, everyone or the priests would be watching the great high priest enter through the curtain and go into the Holy of Holies where no one was worthy to go before God. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, tells us that Jesus has gone through the heavens. Jesus pulled back that curtain, so to speak. When he died on the cross, we read in Matthew 27, when he spoke his final words, what happened? We know, according to Matthew chapter 27, I think it's verse 50, 51, 52, right in there, the temple curtain was ripped in two, right down the middle. 
And if you read about the curtain itself in the temple at the time of Jesus, they, Josephus, early church historian, uh, tells us that the, the temple that was in the curtain was about 60 feet tall, and it was about four inches thick. And even if you lit it on fire, it would take hours or days to burn because this material was so thick and literally was impossible to rip into. And we know that Jesus, though, he entered into the most holy of holy because he was worthy to come before God the Father because he was offering himself as a perfect, spotless sacrifice for my sin and your sin and the sins of the whole world. And so he went through the heavens, so to speak, to make atonement for our sins. And he rose from the dead, conquering sin and conquering death. The curtain was torn in two. And when Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended away in the book of Acts. The last time the disciples saw him, he ascended out of their sight into the heavens to sit down at the right hand of the throne of God. So the first reason I am praising the Lord that Jesus is the high priest and king for me and for you is he has gone through the heavens. The second reason on my top 10 list is from Hebrews 4, 15 says he is able to sympathize with our weaknesses. Look at verse 15 of Hebrews 4. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way just as we are, yet was without sin. Friends, when you are tempted... When you are troubled, when you are in despair, you're ready to give up or you're ready to give in to, to temptation. You have a great high priest. I have a great high priest who understands. He gets it. You see, he was tempted in every way. Just like you and I. Yet the one difference is he never gave in. He was pure. And because of that, he could go to the cross and he could pay the penalty for your sin and my sin to provide salvation, to give us this kingdom of righteousness, to bring peace between you and me and God the Father who is holy and without sin because Jesus was without sin. He is able to sympathize with us in our weaknesses and we battle every day of our life the temptations of, of the flesh and the, and the eyes and the world that we live in first corinthians 10 13 is a verse that i've memorized in high school and i've had to quote it many times and i have failed at many times as well not to uh, utilize the truth of this verse but first corinthians 10 13 says no temptation has seized you Accept what is common to man. But God is faithful. And when you are tempted, he will provide a way out so that you can stand up under temptation. My friends, Jesus is able, because he is the great high priest, to sympathize with us in our weaknesses. So let's go to him and let's seek out his power and his protection to overcome the temptation that we experience. The third reason I am thankful that Jesus is my great high priest is this truth in verse 15 of chapter 4 that he was without sin. You see, the Levitical priests, they had to offer a sacrifice every day and it wasn't enough. It wasn't sufficient to meet the need to provide covering for once and for all. But Jesus, we know, he offered himself once and for all. With his cries, with his tears, he was the one and the only one that could save us from eternal death 
eternal separation from God and hell and to give us life abundant because he was without sin, because he was pure and spotless. And I am so thankful for his purity that's provided redemption for me and for you and for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord Jesus. The fourth reason I am so thankful that Jesus is my high priest is, is Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. We can approach the throne of grace with confidence. Look at Hebrews 4, 16. It says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He is the creator of heaven and earth. Even Genesis 14 in the ESV, it said, He is the possessor of heaven and earth. And I love that. He is the possessor. It speaks of the reality that He has everything in His hands. He is the possessor. And, and because of all that He has done, this King of righteousness, this King of peace that has come, who has gone through the heavens, who was without sin, He understands us. We can approach Him. We can approach the throne of grace. Us, who are just begging for mercy, He invites you. He invites you when you are weak, when you are, and not just when you're weak, but every second of every day. He invites us before the throne of grace. We can approach Him with confidence. Before we were in a place we were not worthy to approach Him. And now because of His righteousness and what He's given to us and done for us, we can come to Him and we can call out to Him and approach Him. We are His royal guests, so to speak, to come and dine with Him, to pour out our heart to Him. And if that's not an encouragement to you to be a man or a woman of just prayer, I don't know what is. Because he has just, just laid out the table for us and done everything for you and I to be men and women who will seek him, who will know him, and who will walk in, in, a, in, in a manner worthy he's called us to walk, but to, to be men and women who simply the first thing in the, in, in, that we do every day is, is look to him. Just like I talked about last week, that we would look up to him. And we would trust him. And this would be done by faith, obviously. The fifth uh, thing on my top ten list of reasons I am thankful that Jesus is my high priest is in Hebrews 4, 16. And it follows on the heels of approaching the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace and to find help in our time of need. And, and even just this week in my life, I mean, there have been multiple times this week where life was just a hot mess. I was burdened. I was struggling with something, uh, something in my family, uh, just things at church, just, just burdened with things and just coming to him and giving my burdens over to him and knowing I can approach his throne of confident with, of grace with confidence knowing that He is going to meet me. He is going to give answers. He is going to provide hope and peace, security. Uh, what do you do if you don't have that in your life? I don't know how people honestly make it uh, apart from Jesus. Do you lean on your own understanding? Do you just try to do things yourself? And if that's you, then just quit. Just knock it off. Because you can come to the great high priest who has everything that you need in your time of need. And he will meet your need. And number six on my list, reasons why I am so thankful that Jesus is my great high priest, is in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. Because he's the source of eternal salvation. Hebrews tells us in 5, 9, or actually 8, Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. 
And he was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. Again, my salvation is not based on my works or anything that I have done. Because as I read my uh, Bible in Ephesians chapter 2, my salvation, the source of it is completely from him. Ephesians 2, 1, I am dead in sins. Ephesians 2, 3, I am an object of wrath. And then Ephesians 2, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his love, made me alive with Christ. And so I know that he is my source of salvation. So I better not ever look to myself to be a source of righteousness. I look to Jesus alone. He is my source of righteousness. He is the source of my eternal salvation. And I praise God for that today. My number seven on my list here is that he is, is, uh, gives me hope as an anchor for my soul. He gives me hope as an anchor for my soul. This is Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. We have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Abram had hope in God's word. Abram trusted in God, even as we see waiting for his son Isaac. Uh, he waited about 25 years after God told him he was going to bless him with a descendant, and he would have many descendants. 25 years, that's a long time to wait. That's a long time to have hope. But we have hope, just as Abram had hope, we have hope as an anchor for our soul, firm and secure. And I know that many people in our world don't have hope. I was looking at Facebook the other day, reading the Thurston County Scanner. There was a report of a young lady who was dangling or just about to jump off of the I-5 bridge right by Dairy Queen, right here on Slater, Kinney, or Lily Road. And that's just heartbreaking to think of this young woman who would just be at this place where she has no hope. There's nothing grounding her, giving her firmness and security uh, and, and thankfully that the authorities got there before this young lady jumped. But we know uh, just the, the sadness and the despair that's all around us in our world because of having no hope in Christ, no hope in eternity, no hope for what's going to happen after death. And, and I praise the Lord that you and I can have hope uh, because we are moored to God. The Father moored this idea when somebody brings their sailboat in or boat in, you know, off the ocean. I, I see boats all the time. They come in and they, they moor, they, they tie up, they drop anchor to a, a salvation that is firm and secure. And that is who Jesus, the great high priest, that's, that's what he does for you and I. We have a hope as an anchor for the soul and, and you know what? My number eight on my list comes from Hebrews chapter 7, verse 17 and 19. Uh, he says, For it is declared you are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The former regulation is set aside because it was weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect, and a better hope is introduced by which we draw near to God. So number eight is that a better hope has been introduced. The Old Testament system was ultimately weak and useless to cover our sins. It was only temporary. The law made nothing perfect. It only exposed our sin. But Jesus came introducing a better hope, something to hope for, a new covenant that he would give us a new heart. Our hearts didn't need fixing. Our hearts needed replacing. We needed a new heart. We needed to become a new creation to be made alive with Christ. And this better hope is what we have now through the new covenant. This better way that Jesus has provided redemption, eternal salvation for our sins. Praise God. Amen. And my number nine on uh, my list is the next part of that verse, Hebrews seven nineteen. A better hope has been introduced by which we draw near to God. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. Just as Jesus died on the cross and that temple was cut into two, now you and I have access to come into the most holy of holies every day 
through the righteousness and the peace that Jesus brought to you and I, we now can call God Abba, Father. We can rest our head on His shoulder. We can come and pour out our heart to Him and find life and find hope. And, and my number 10 on my top 10 list is from Hebrews 7, 23 to 25. Jesus lives forever, and he is the permanent priest. And we read in Hebrews 7, 23 to 25, Now there have been many priests since death prevented them from continuing in office, but because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. He is the eternal one. He is the alpha and the omega, the firstborn over all creation. He stepped down into time. It actually says in John 1.14, when Jesus came and was made flesh, he, he dwelt among us. He tabernacled among us. He made his tent here in this punk of flesh like you and I have. And he was without sin so that he could go to that cross. He could die on the cross. He could enter into the throne room of God to intercede for you and for me to be the permanent priest in the order of Melchizedek to bring this righteousness and to bring this peace. Friends, do you know Jesus? Because if you don't, now is the time again to humble yourself and turn to him and to love and be loved by this king of righteousness and this king of peace who is the permanent priest. And I am so thankful that Jesus Christ is my king. I am so thankful that he is the great high priest who lives forever, who is coming back to this earth to rapture the church, to bring in uh, a lot to come. But uh, friends, uh, we love you at EBF. We want to help you grow in your faith. I have uh, put a video attachment on to the sermon notes. You can find the sermon notes uh, on our EBF app or on the church website every week. And there is a very interesting video that I put on there about who is Melchizedek. And I would encourage you to check that out. We have discussion questions. If you're in a small group, you can go through those. You, I would encourage you to read the book of Hebrews or especially the chapters 4 through 10, to dive more into uh, this discussion about Jesus bring, being our great high priest. But my prayer for you, for us as a church, is that we would be men and women, boys and girls, who are not ashamed of the gospel, who are living out our faith in Christ, who is our great high priest, and sharing about Jesus with those around us. The, the, the fields are ripe for harvest, uh, but Jesus said the workers are few. Will you and I be workers who go out and serve him? And I'll end with this last passage here uh, because we're commissioned to do this where it says uh, Jesus sacrificed um, for our sins once for all when he offered himself. And he now has given us a ministry, a ministry of reconciliation. And this blood of Christ through the eternal spirit, offered himself unblemished to Christ to cleanse our consciences from acts that lead to death so that we may serve the living God. So I'm going to pray for us now, and then you're going to get on with your Sunday. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the power of your word. I thank you that it, it beautifully connects from Genesis to Psalms all the way to Hebrews. This book that was written by uh, 40 different authors, 66 different books over the span of almost 1,500 years. It doesn't contradict. There are no errors. It perfectly complements itself and ties together and prophesies about the coming Jesus. And we thank you for sending your Son. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you that the Word made flesh and dwelt among us and now has gone through the heavens, and someday we are going to be there with you, and you are preparing a place for us. Soon and very soon, you are going to come back, and we are going to meet our king and our high priest. 
And may we love you every day. May we live for you and offer ourselves to you, present ourselves and present our bodies to you, to honor you and to glorify you. And if we're not, Lord, may we just confess that, humble ourselves. May we seek out people in our lives that will spur us on towards love and good deeds. And God, we just love you and we thank you and pray that you would be glorified. We pray and we know that the gates of hell will not come against the church. And so we pray you would strengthen the church in this age, not only our church, Emmanuel, but the other churches in the world. We pray for the persecuted Christians of the world, that you would strengthen them to stand for their faith. We pray that you would prepare us for persecution that's coming our way. And we pray that you would give us unity. Even as we move inside here in the next couple of weeks, give us unity. Give us love for one another. May we not be afraid. May we not be ashamed. And God, we glorify your name and we worship you and pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Hey, if you have questions about anything, if you want some materials to grow in your faith in Christ, let us know. Uh, we have a number of things coming up in the weeks to come. We have a men's group starting, the, going through the 33 series. It will be on Monday nights, starting at the beginning of October. You can sign up online for that. Uh, our women had to cancel their women's retreat that they had scheduled, but they are encouraging you to go to the one-day retreat that's happening out at Black Lake Bible Camp on the first Saturday in October. And you can find information about that on Black Lake Bible Camp, uh, their website. Um, youth group is going every week. We'd encourage you to send your high school, junior high students on Tuesdays and Wednesdays to youth group. And I'm sure there's other things I'm missing out on, but we love you. And let us know how we can help you. And have a great day. Thanks. Bye.